Hey Active Mamas, it's Alex, local physical therapist to the Cincinnati area. I am passionate about women's health and I like to help keep moms moving before, during, and after birth. Today, based on your guys' input, I am inviting my friend Jalissa to cover the topics of using movement and essential oils to help you thrive during motherhood. Um, I am not an expert in the use of essential oils, so that's why I use Jalissa to help me along with this topic because she's my go-to resource when it comes to aromatherapy and essential oils. Thanks, Alex. I appreciate you having me here for this video with you. And um, yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about aromatherapy and essential oils during pregnancy, postpartum, what is safe and what things are recommended or not recommended to do when you're pregnant, since we want to be as safe as possible. Just a little background in myself. I do have a certificate in essential oil business, and I'm currently working on my certificate in aromatherapy right now. So hopefully we'll have that done before the new year, but um, I'm still working on that. And I'm excited to share some of my information and my research with you guys today. And before we get started discussing the topics in detail, I did want to give a quick disclaimer. Um, most of what we talk about today applies to uncomplicated pregnancies and postpartum. Um, so the information we cover is just for educational and informational purposes. If you have individual questions, do go over those with your individual provider, or you can feel free to follow up with either of us individually as well. Um, and just always make sure when we talk about exercise that you have clearance from your provider to be doing the types of exercises that we discuss. Um, it's always a good option to touch base with a women's health or pelvic floor physical therapist during pregnancy and postpartum as well if that's an option to you. And with all that out of the way, we're going to go ahead and get started with, I'll cover the topic today of just using movement in pregnancy. Um, so some of you might be familiar with the recommendation generally for Americans. We recommend uh, using like 150 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic exercise a week. And that recommendation is actually continued into pregnancy in the postpartum period. Um, as many of you know, if you're either pregnant or have been pregnant, there's a lot of fears that are surrounding pregnancy itself. And some people are afraid that uh, exercise might increase the risk of miscarriage or have negative effects on the fetus. And I can tell you today that uh, looking at our current evidence that we have, we have very li limited evidence uh, to show negative effects to the fetus during exercise, unless you're in rare cases that you're exercising at really high intensity. So usually mom is going to be experiencing some symptoms of like exhaustion and fatigue. So we do want to avoid that. So the general rule of thumb that we've seen is safe during pregnancy is exercising at like 70 to 75% of your maximum heart rate. And uh, we want to usually keep our time period of exercise within about 45 minutes a session, unless you are a really well-trained individual. So, and uh, another general rule of thumb, you can continue what activities you were doing prior to pregnancy, uh, but uh, you do want to just slowly grade into activities that would be new to you. So, and always monitor your symptoms and reach out to maybe even like a women's health PT if you have questions on how to do that safely. So uh, why exercise basically during pregnancy? A lot of us don't feel good in the first trimester, um, but there are some great benefits that you can get from exercising, such as reducing your risk of cesarean section, uh, preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, Exercise can help improve your mood and can help uh, improve your cardiovascular function. So from the recovery side of things too, usually the better that you go into birth in terms of your endurance and strength, the quicker you'll recover a lot of that uh, foundational endurance and strength. So there can be benefits for afterbirth as well. Um, there are a lot of changes that we're experiencing during pregnancy with the hormones that are circulating in our bodies, like 
some laxity in some of our ligaments and joints. So that changes how we move, our center of gravity changes as our bellies are growing. Um, so getting in touch and getting connected with your body through movement and exercise can be helpful to also reduce any aches and pains and some risk of injury um, if we're doing movements that our bodies just are not used to. So in speaking of movements that we may not be used to, as we enter the postpartum period, so after the baby has been born, there are going to be new loads that our bodies are experiencing, especially if this is your first child. So loads like just holding the baby and carrying the baby, lifting the baby, lifting the really heavy car seat. Jalissa, you probably know how that is too. Um, and just being in feeding postures for longer periods of time. So what we do during pregnancy can actually, again, like I said about postpartum recovery, that can help us uh, adapt to those loads quicker. So with that, that all said, I'm going to turn it over to Jalissa to tell us all about how essential oils can support us in pregnancy. Of course. Thanks, Alex. Um, uh, so to just start off um, with aromatherapy, I want you to know that essential oils and the use of them are not regulated by the FDA because they're not considered a drug or a treatment um, overseen by medical professionals. And aromatherapists, whether certified, whether they have their diploma, a certificate, whatever it may be that their qualification is in aromatherapy, um, the way it is functioning is based off of recommendation and advice and not specific treatment. So I just want you to understand that because it's important as you're pregnant, you want to be as safe as possible. And essential oils are what's called high And when we're using them around us, on us, whatever it may be, we want to be as careful as possible while we're pregnant, when we're postpartum. So please always check in with your doctor, your midwife, whoever is your care provider when you're pregnant and postpartum and um, get their advice and their recommendation on how or when they think uh, essential oils can be used during your pregnancy. Generally, high-risk pregnancies should not use essential oils. You just don't want anything to interfere with that. Again, check with your provider. Depending on why you're high-risk, it might be okay to use them, but I'm not going to give any specific statements on that today. And then also, as a disclaimer, make sure to follow any sensitivities or allergies you might have in your household when it comes to essential oils. Some people have nut allergies, so they're not going to be able to use certain oils. Some might have a sensitivity to peppermint or cinnamon. Make sure that you're following those sensitivities with the essential oils because they are the plant extracts. And whether you're inhaling them, using essential oils topically, it'll likely bother you at that point. So um, while we're using essential oils, oils when we're pregnant, it's important that if we're using them topically, that um, we are always using them at a very low dilution. So we want to use them at a 1% to 2% max dilution, which is of the whole entire product, um, whether we're mixing essential oils in with the lotion, with a carrier oil, like coconut oil, almond oil, avocado oil, olive oil, pretty much any type of oil you can mix essential oils with. Um, make sure that that total percentage is only 2% or lower of the essential oils. So for example, you could mix one drop of essential oil into one teaspoon of carrier oil, and you can then conduct a skin test to make sure you're not going to have any adverse reaction. You can you take that teaspoon of essential oil and curry oil, rub it on your arm, um, rub it on your hand, wait 30 minutes. If there's no reaction, then you're not going to have a sensitive um, issue with that essential oil. So that would be a safe way to start using essential oils when you're pregnant, even when you're not pregnant, to make sure that there is no possible reaction from that. The next thing that we often use for essential oils with is going to be diffusion. A lot of us have heard of diffusion. Um, it's one of the um, 
easiest ways to utilize essential oils in our life. It's much safer when you're pregnant um, to use essential oils by diffusion. Basically, you're going to drop some essential oils in the water that's over an ultrasonic plate, then that disperses the essential oils into the air. We get to inhale those benefits of the essential oils, whether we're trying to relax, whether we're trying to have energy, whether we're trying to clear sinuses. We are inhaling, and that's how we're reaping the aroma therapeutic benefit at that point. So diffusion is considered completely safe for pregnancy, but on that note, there are definitely essential oils to avoid during pregnancy. So yes, you can use topically. Yes, you can use with diffusion and inhalation, but you need to make sure you're following safe essential oil usage guidelines. So some specific essential oils that you do not want to use during pregnancy are going to be clary sage. And that's simply because clary sage is known to um, regulate uterine contractions. And so you don't want to use that during pregnancy. You don't want any reason to make you to start contracting. Um, so you can use it when you're in active labor, but not while you're pregnant. You can use it even for menstrual cramps, which is wonderful, but not while you're pregnant. Then other ones are going to be peppermint, wintergreen, comfort, basil, rosemary, oregano, clove, cinnamon, thyme, sage, and on a seed. This is not a complete list of essential oils to avoid, but these are the most common essential oils that are gonna be in someone's cabinet if they're an essential oil user or looking to use some while they're pregnant. I will touch on one more essential oil and that's gonna be peppermint. There are some safe ways to use that when you're pregnant, but make sure that you're using them only on your, your legs or your arms. You don't want to use peppermint um, anywhere near the uterine barrier at that point. So basically not on your stomach, not on your chest, not on your lower back. And it's also best to avoid um, around your chest after um, in postpartum usage because peppermint does have some research studies out there that show that it can decrease your milk supply. So definitely not something you wanna use when you're breastfeeding. Um, so that covers some of the basics when it comes to using essential oils while you're pregnant. Make sure you're following the proper dilution. Make sure you're not using essential oils that are harmful or too harsh when you're pregnant. And then avoid areas near your stomach and potentially your lower back if you're using some stronger essential oils. And always check with your care provider. So um, Alex, if you want to cover the next section, that'll be great. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So. Uh, next, we're going to start talking about how to use these things postpartum. So I'll touch on how to use movement postpartum. Uh, my focus postpartum is how can we support your healing and recovery? And basically, we're going to have progressive healing and recovery. So a question I often get is basically like, okay, I, I hit my six week clearance, my provider cleared me. So like I can go back to the exercises I was doing, at, you know, before pregnancy, right? And that's really not the case. And what I'm going to compare it to is basically uh, recovery after a major surgery. So we'll go with the surgery of an ACL reconstruction. Um, and just to give you a background, if you're not that familiar with those kind of healing timelines, after an ACL reconstruction, those patients are typically not returning to sport until at least nine months after surgery and sometimes even like a year or later. Um, so in a similar way, pregnancy itself, but also the event of birth. Um, we have a lot of changes that are happening to our pelvic floors into our core and other areas of our body as well. So those need time to heal and recover just as we would give our bodies time to heal and recover after major surgery. Um, unfortunately in the US, I think sometimes our messaging is that uh, we should just be able to rebound and bounce back quickly. Um, and that just isn't the case. So when we look into what the research is showing us, 100% um, of women at term when they give birth will have some separation in their abdominals. And that's basically just to accommodate our growing babies. Um, so it's going to take from some research studies, at least six months for those abdominals to return to a more like new normal state. And in some cases that can take a little bit longer. So the healing timelines overall for postpartum recovery that I've seen can vary anywhere from about a year to 18 months and in some cases two years. 
And that just depends on a lot of factors like um, looking at if you had any complications during pregnancy, during birth, or have any other medical conditions or complications, your typical healing as well as your typical tissue integrity, because we all can have different genetics and different uh, makeups of our tissues. And if you're breastfeeding, the hormones that stay in our bodies can also delay some healing that is going on. And then if you're caring for a newborn, many of us are not getting sleep, may not be getting the best nutrition, but uh, those things can also support our recovery as well. So not only are we thinking about movement and exercise, but how we can use movement and exercise to support those different areas. And if you're in the first six weeks, if you're in even the first three months, sometimes movement may not be your biggest focus. Um, but as I say that, I'll, I'll use a little caveat that your mental health is also important. So we want to balance these considerations with the fact that for some women, movement is how they reconnect with their identity. Um, so we want to find a balance of promoting healing in the body uh, without causing injury or unnecessary pain. So to just go through the example of how we would typically want to use movement to support our recovery, I'm going to go over like return to running. Not everyone is going to return, want to return to running or maybe even uh, return to running at all postpartum if that's not your thing, but you can apply this to different activities that you enjoy. So if we're looking at someone wanting to return to running, we're going to start with looking at their breathing. So later in pregnancy, our ribs are going to change to accommodate the baby. So as we reach the postpartum period, things are going to slowly drift back to their new normal. So we just want to help promote that return to the new normal um, and use our lungs in the way that they're meant to be and not necessarily how we were using them in pregnancy. So you want to be able to uh, get back to normal breathing patterns and just check and make sure that you're not um, creating a lot of pressure with how you're currently breathing, especially if you're doing new or difficult activities. Um, this is something we'll touch on in a future video, but a lot of people use breath holding, which can work for some people and other people can begin to cause issues with our abdominals and our pelvic floor as they're still trying to heal. So we would get down breathing, uh, we would get down our pressure management, we would look at your posture and see if that's uh, helping you or maybe contributing to any pain that you may be experiencing. And then as you get back to your new activities, especially in the postpartum period, we're just going to monitor for any pain, especially any like pelvic floor pain, back pain, um, and then any other symptoms of like leakage, bowel or bladder. Um, while some people may think that that is normal during the postpartum period, especially once we hit our six week checkup and definitely at the three month point, um, we should be addressing that if that's an issue and not pushing beyond that in our case of return to running, we shouldn't be returning to running until those issues are addressed. So if I was to have someone come to me and say, hey, am I ready to return to running? Um, I would look at, okay, can you do some single leg calf raises? Can you do some standing leg kicks out to the side and hold your balance? And also, can you do some single leg squats? Just because those are gonna be the type of movements you're gonna need um, while you're doing that running activity so that we're not putting undue stress, again, on our core and our pelvic floor that, as we've talked about, could be healing up to a year, maybe even up to like two years postpartum. So we just wanna make sure we have a solid foundation before we even return to some of those more quote unquote like exercise activities. So there's a lot you can do between that six week clearance point and your return to exercise. Um, so our, our focus in the postpartum period is a lot of, uh, you know, from my point of view, still keeping you mentally well. So finding activities that support your healing, but don't contribute to further injury and pain for you. So uh, that kind of covers a general overview of postpartum. So I'm going to let Jalissa talk about how essential oils can support us too. Wonderful. Thanks, Alex. I actually have a quick question about that last section. Um, sure. You said you, you would basically check to see if they could do certain exercises before they would get a recommendation to return to running. 
Some women may not have done those exercises very often. Um, is there a certain point where they could start practicing those exercises postpartum? Is it basically as soon as that they feel able, they could start practicing those exercises, and then once they can do them well, then they could return to running when they check with a physical therapist or their care provider? Yeah, so that would that would generally be it. So usually the, our timeline would kind of be it, at the very least to start some of those more like the calf raises those three exercises we talked about would be you would want to have your six week clearance so it's going to be different for everyone if you're not experiencing pain leakage or anything like that you may not need to go see a physical therapist but i'm always going to be supportive of seeing like a pelvic floor or women's health pt just to make sure that everything Mm -hmm. uh, foundation wise is working um, but you can start to work towards those exercises and a lot of this kind of comes back to what we talked about it was how active were you during pregnancy mm -hmm. of where you would start in returning to those three exercises. So if you hadn't really been doing many like squats, especially single leg squats, you wouldn't necessarily start with your exercises of doing a single leg squat. You would definitely want to start with like a double leg squat. Um, and typically, uh, you know, we can start with some amount of foundational exercise after that physician clearance. Um, and then in, in the case of running too, in a lot of cases, especially if you're breastfeeding in the research, they're seeing that maybe we should be waiting till at least like three to four months before adding really those impact activities, but it is going to be case to case. Makes sense. Thanks. That was great. Yeah, great question. Um, yeah, so as far as postpartum use of essential oils, you're definitely um, able to use essential oils postpartum. The only um, disclaimer I would have about using essential oils postpartum at the beginning of this is um, you, there are products out there that you can buy for postpartum topical and internal healing if you've had a vaginal birth, if you've had a C-section, and those products that might have essential oils in them have gone through rigorous testing and even if they're not regulated by the FDA they have gone through a lot of testing and research done on those products so I would encourage you not to use essential oils in um, concoctions whatever you might call them that you make yourself for those healing purposes it might be better to purchase something or make sure that you talk to someone who has a certification or is an expert in that field if you want to use essential oils for any type of postpartum um, topical healing from a vaginal or cesarean section um, birth just to be on the safe side you don't want to damage anything or have any sensitivities in those areas so um, with that it is great to use essential oils after um, you've had a baby for postpartum use, whether you're looking to have energy and maybe you're monitoring your caffeine intake and you're just exhausted and you need some pick me up. Um, maybe you are tr having trouble falling asleep. I know I had a lot of, mm. as tired as I was, I put the baby to sleep and I would just lay there and all the things would race through my head. Okay, what am I, did I do everything to make sure we're, we're not gonna have SIDS? Did I, do this? Did I do that? And um, it was really hard to fall asleep at times. And so essential oils are a really great way to aid in those factors. But um, specifically, how to use essential oils safely after the baby is born, um, while healing six to eight weeks continue, follow the safe pregnancy usage guidelines I just outlined previously. Make sure that it's a low dilution, make sure that you're avoiding certain sensitive areas, and then once you're cleared by your doctor, you can return to semi-regular essential oil use. You can use higher dilution rates, up to 4%, um, and then you'll have less limitations on the usable oils as well. Um, with that in mind, there are certain essential oils that you'll want to avoid near the baby, you want to avoid topically if you're going to come in contact with the baby. So if you're holding your baby and um, you put essential oils on your arms or on your chest area, on your neck or something like that, um, there are many resources out there that show you the essential oils that are safe for children and babies, not necessarily to use on them, but are safe to use around them. And I'm not going to go through that whole list today, but please let me know if you have any questions on that. I would be happy to send you those resources. And so you just want to be careful when you're holding or you're near the baby if you use them topically so that you're not getting them rubbed all over the baby at that point.
Um, secondly, you'll want to avoid diffusing in your room if you have the baby in a bassinet next to you. If you're co-sleeping or doing something along those lines, diffusion is best when um, to avoid when the baby is really little up to that three month mark for sure. Um, there are some ways to diffuse called passive diffusing. That's where you put essential oils on an object versus an aromatic diffuser. And um, then you can use that object as more of like a personal inhaler for the essential oils. You could use a tissue, you could use a stuffed animal. There are actual passive diffusers out there that are made from clay that absorb the essential oils and then it lasts longer. So there are definitely ways to use the essential oils around your baby, around your other children safely. We just still need to be cautious. And um, then that leads to some other factors of um, using essential oils to aid with um, sleeping and relaxation, like I mentioned. Um, this is gonna be the same for pregnancy and for postpartum. If we're looking to aid in sleep, for instance, um, we want to try and focus on relaxing the mind, try and get those thoughts to stop racing through our mind, relax the body, those muscles in our body that are tense from nursing the baby and holding the baby and all of those things that tense tense up from posture. Yes, um, definitely work with the physical therapist to try and learn how to have better posture. But at the end of the day, we're probably not going to be perfect and we're still going to have some sore muscles. And so um, using essential oils to aid in relaxation is wonderful that. A great uh, a popular choice for this would be um, try diffusing if the baby's in the other room or uh, maybe you're gonna be in a different room for a little while. Try diffusing lavender, vetiver, and bergamot together. Um, the lavender and vetiver are very grounding and relaxing and then the bergamot helps um, kind of calm the chatter in the brain, which is great. Um, another one would be cedarwood, lavender, orange, and Roman chamomile. Um, chamomile is like the powerhouse of like calming essential oils. Mix that with something that's grounding and then a citrus, and you've got yourself a great mix of essential oils to fall asleep to. Um, as far as topical use, um, to help ease the body with sore muscles and um, uh, overall movement when you're pregnant and postpartum, some things that you can look to um, to help with the daily aches and pains because, you know, we have all that relaxing in our body when we're pregnant and it just, it, we just hurt sometimes and we can't do anything about it. We'll have lower back pain. We have pain in our, um, our thighs and our calves and our feet. Um, one thing that we can do to help with that is we can mix essential oils into lotion. Lotion absorbs quickly versus a carrier oil. And so you can give yourself kind of a massage in those sore areas, which will help work the muscles out a little bit. But a great um, combination is going to be vetiver, lavender, and eucalyptus globalis. Um, there are a few different variations of eucalyptus. Try and look for the globalis um, NC name, which is the scientific name on that essential oil because that one is specifically deemed pregnancy safe. There are other ones that can be, but that one's the good one to look for. So eucalyptus globalis, lavender and vetiver, mix that in a lotion and massage it into your sore areas. If you're using it at a 1% or less dilution, then you can use it on your lower back, your shoulders, and some of those um, sensitive areas when you're pregnant, but make sure that it's at like a 1% dilution if you're using um, some of those oils for a deep massage at that point. Um, and then another way that we can aid sleep, and this one's great for postpartum because you can use it when you are um, near the baby and you're using um, a bassinet or something close near your bed to put the baby in for sleeping is a linen spray. So linen sprays are a mix of water and emulsifier and essential oils to spray on your pillows, sheets, etc. They're a great way for when you're near the baby because it's localized and it's not going to be emitted into the room very much. And so I used a linen spray when my baby, when my daughter was in the bassinet next to me, I would spray it on my pillow and then the sheets and it have really calming oils like lavender and vetiver and vanilla and different things like that that I enjoyed. Um, and so I could lay down on the pillow and I would smell that and it'd be close to my face and it would 
be gone by the time I wake up and uh, nurse my daughter at that point. So it's a very safe, localized way to use essential oils to get that inhalation benefit of essential oils without affecting any sensitivities the little baby might have at that point. So one last section on um, some ways to use essential oils when you're pregnant and postpartum would be um, for stress. I was really stressed when I was pregnant at times. I actually started the new job the day after I found out I was pregnant. Oh so I was, I was just a little bit stressed. I found out I was pregnant. I started a new job oh. and then was just basically waiting around twiddling my thumbs until I was like, okay, I have to tell my boss now oh. that I'm pregnant and I'm taking 12 weeks of maternity leave when I haven't even been at the job for a whole year yet. Mm. So there was, there was lots of stress with that. And then postpartum stress, my daughter was born on February 9th and all of Ohio shut down three weeks later for COVID. So over the last, she's almost nine months now, over the last basically nine months, life has not been what it's expected to be whatsoever. And so to raise a baby in that isolation was very stressful at times and you know, bring all the other COVID stress on as well and just raising a baby. Let's just leave it at that. Just raising a baby can be stressful. So um, some of the ways that we can combat that is with diffusion and with inhalation. So I mentioned that inhalation is going to be when you're using a passive diffuser, an object with essential oils on it, where it's basically localized to just you using it, where you can inhale the benefit of the essential oil. You can have a mixture, a blend of essential oils or a single essential oil. Some people like to just open the cap of an essential oil and take Take a couple whiffs, make sure that you're having some good calming breaths with that. Take a couple more whiffs, a couple more calming breaths, and you'll be amazed at how that might just calm you down at that point. But both diffusion and inhalation are used for physiological aromatherapeutic benefits. So it's not just about what's going on in our brain or what's going on in our body, but those things connect. As you know, with physical therapy, and postpartum healing, sometimes it's a mind game. You know, we have mind over matter with certain things. If we tell ourselves we can't do something, we're not going to be able to do it. If we are encouraged and we're motivated to do something, if we're motivated to heal, if we're motivated to move on, then there's a higher likelihood that our body is going to get there too. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that is with how essential oils work with your body. If um, you are using it with the idea of it's just going to help this and it's not going to help these things things, then there's a chance that you're really limiting, limiting yourself in how the essential oils can help your body. Mm. So make sure that you're keeping an open mind about how essential oils can work. Everyone is going to have different reactions. Some have strong reactions to certain essential oils of, oh, this is super relaxing to me. Other essential oils are going to be more relaxing to a different person. So with that, whether using a personal inhaler, um, which you can find on some essential oil companies websites, or a mixture of grounding oils, um, I would look to when you're stressed and you're trying to find a way to calm down from that stress, um, I would have a combination of grounding oils up and uplifting oils together, okay? So the uplifting oils are generally going to be some sort of citrus, orange, grapefruit of bergamot. Those are gonna be the three most common essential oils used in a blend or singles to really just encourage you to help with stress. Maybe you have some postpartum depression going on. And um, as if you do some research, you'll realize that postpartum depression comes from hormonal changes that are happening in your body, some hormonal imbalances. So essential oils are not going to fix your postpartum depression, but they might help with some of those those emotional waves that you feel throughout the day. So that's something to consider. Then some of the grounding oils would be lavender, cedarwood, copaiba, chamomile, things that are relaxing. And, um, and then on top of all of that, adding a touch of an oil that helps with our emotional well-being, but might be too strong to use all by itself would be something like frankincense or geranium. There are a few different um, variations of those essential oils, but at this point you'll be postpartum if you're using them. So it's completely acceptable to use 
any variation of that for inhalation purposes. So um, just to review, if you're looking for some essential oil use when you are stressed, maybe you have some postpartum depression going on, try and pair grounding oils with an uplifting oil and then add something that is specifically um, known for emotional support like frankincense or geranium. And if you have any questions, let me know. I have a few blends that I put together that are um, pointed towards helping with that stress. Um, they call it postpartum blues. And um, it, it would be good to look into figuring out what works for you because sometimes just because it's a pre-made blend won't be what works exactly for you either. You have to work with it to figure it out. So that's kind of um, how to use essential oils when you're pregnant, when you're postpartum. I definitely didn't cover everything, but I hope I hit the big points so you know what isn't safe specifically and how to at least start incorporating essential oils into some routines for sleeping, relaxing, stress, sore muscles, things like that. And um, I hope that you'll be able to find ways to use them after this video. Yes. Thank you so much, Jalissa. That was like wonderful. I personally learned so much and like, I'm going to go back and watch this video and <laughs> look at your notes just to be like, okay, <laughs> remember these. Um, but just as a side note to everyone. So um, Jalissa and I connected initially and I have tried Jalissa's essential oils. I have tried a custom blend now for like pain relief. And A, I, Jalissa, I can tell you're a music teacher just from like how you talk about like the balance in the notes and the oils. <laughs> you can like see that come through in your products. Like they are just so well blended. Like oh, thank it's you. coming like just to smell them. Like, and then you get like the topical application as well. I, I personally really enjoy them. I have no affiliation with Jalissa. I have no reason to, you know, talk about her products, but if people are interested in trying your products, Jalissa, how would they go about doing that? Of course. Thanks for the free advertising, Alex. Yeah. Um, uh, the biggest way that you could do is go to my Facebook page or Instagram in the bio and on my Facebook page. I do have order forms up right now. My business is called Blooming Essentials. Um, my username is BE by Jalissa, which is also my email by Jalissa at gmail.com. And so you can look to see some of the things I've posted. I try and post a product picture of almost everything I have available right now. I know I'm a little bit behind in some of those things, but such as the life of being a mom with an mm -hmm. eight and a half month old. So um, if you have any questions, I have a lot of products on the order form and you can message me about those products. And at this point, I don't have prices up for custom blends, but I'm I'm happy to work with people to create a custom blend, whether it's a massage oil, whether it's a um, roller blend. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of options with aromatherapy. So um, that would be the easiest way to contact me. Again, you can um, do my Facebook page, my Instagram. You can send me an email. Um, all that information is out there. And I'm sure we'll post some of that contact information under this video as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so if you have questions for myself or Jalissa, look in the information under this video. And like she said, we'll put our contacts information down there. And you can also either comment or message us mm -hmm. uh, with questions. Or if there's a topic that you'd like to see us cover in the future, specifically from Jalissa about aromatherapy, let us know that too, because we do take that into consideration as we make new videos. Um, topics I think that we could cover next would be just specific application for back pain and pregnancy and postpartum since that's what I see a lot and I also think um, something we've talked about before is just also how would you go about using that um, and to support labor and delivery. Yes, definitely oh. I have I have a lot of things to say on that subject and I Perfect. use some of them myself so I would love to give some tips on that. Great little teaser for our next video. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, and Jalissa, I did have like a follow-up question for you too from your section. So um, in general with like essential oils, either those that you use or specifically if you get like a, a custom blend, how long like shelf-wise should you plan on those lasting? 
So the era. shelf life of each essential oil is a little bit different. None okay. of the shelf lives of an essential oil are less than a year, but sometimes the oils, the carrier oils, let's say it's like vitamin E and for instance, the custom blend I made for you had jojoba, it had um, sunflower oil, it had coconut oil and almond oil, it had a lot of things in it. Um, so jojoba oil is known to have a very, very long shelf life of a couple years. And so if you mix anything with jojoba and vitamin E, which is an antioxidant, which helps keep the oils from oxidizing too quickly, um, you mix those things together and it extends the shelf life of the other oils that might be in that combination um, that would typically be a shorter shelf life. So I say all that because because it's not an exact science of how long will this last. Generally, yeah. a custom blend that I would give you, I would say would have a shelf life of six to 12 months. Okay. And that's gonna be dependent on where you keep it. Um, if you're keeping it in the hot sun the whole time, it might be like three months shelf life. Gotcha. Um, but if you're keeping it inside where you generally have air conditioning or heat and it's kind of a more stable temperature, then it's gonna last that six to 12 months. And, um, other items like a body butter or um, something that is an emulsified uh, product. Um, basically, that means it has like water and oils in it. Okay. Um, those things are going to be uh, probably uh, a round of year. Um, gotcha. It's going to be the shelf life for those. And most of them, if they have gone bad, you can tell based on how it smells. Um, okay. As soon as it goes bad, it's like flipping a switch. It goes bad very quickly and you'll be able to smell it. It'll smell a little rancid. Okay. And so in like, if it did go bad, well, A, you would probably smell it, so you wouldn't use it. But like, does it basically just, um, like, would it just not be as effective if you continued to apply it? Or is there yeah, a like, kind of risk? Um, if it smells bad, it's probably not best to continue using at that point. Yeah. Because rancidity gotcha. isn't just about it oxidizing. It's usually mean there's some, for some reason, uh, that like, growth has gotten in there. Yeah. Essential oils can lose their effect over time without necessarily going rancid. Okay. So if I have a bottle of essential oil, like I know I, there's one I've had for like three years. If I can still smell its scent and yeah. it still smells like the essential oil, then it still has aromatherapy benefit to it. Okay. It may not be as um, beneficial as it was three years ago when it was yeah. extracted from that plant bottled and sent to me, but um, there is going to be aromatherapeutic benefit if it still smells like the original scent that was supposed gotcha. to be part of that oil. So if you notice that it's changing smell, like that would be the time to stop using it basically. Yeah. Um, Specifically with citrus oils, they um, go bad quickly. They have a shelf life of one to two years um, with the citrus essential oils. Almost everything else has a shelf life of longer than that. Okay. Specifically vetiver, vetiver can last like three to five years or more. So it has a very long shelf life. Okay, perfect. Good. Well, yeah, thank you so much for all of your information, Jalissa. And Again, just comment below, let us know what you guys thought about this, any questions that you have, and we hope to see you next time we decide to put together a video for you. Awesome. Thanks, Alex.